All right, here is another episode of Seeds of Music, the web's number one resource for independent artists. I'm Kyle Williams, your host, and this is our weekly web show where I interview successful independent artists and music industry professionals to talk about ways to build a bigger fan base and more make more income with music. Now, this episode is probably the biggest episode that I've done to date, a really, really special one, because I have Steve Rennie, Renman, the Renman, uh, manager of Incubus on the show. I mean, he's been in the music business for over 30 years and has managed Incubus for the past 16 years, uh, where he finally left to go on his own in January of 2014. Uh, and he's now releasing his own educational course for independent musicians called Ren Man U. So I'm, bring, I'm bringing him on the show to talk about uh, his experience managing Incubus, uh, some qualities that set Incubus apart as a successful music act from others, and also to tell us a little bit more about what he offers inside Ren Man U that's going to give you a real, real, real laser-focused peek into how the music business really works from a real music business professional. So you can probably tell I'm excited because uh, you can probably hear it in my voice. But um, yeah, I'm going to stop babbling here and let's just jump straight into the interview. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of Seeds of Music. Um, I can't lie, this one is is a very, very special episode and I'm very honored to have the Ren Man on the show, Steve Rennie. Thanks for coming on, man. Thank you. Honored, honored to be here. And um, I mean, it's not just like having someone uh, with your kind of a raw experience, like no, no bullshit experience on the show. But I can't lie, man. I gotta tell, you, I'm a, I've been a huge Incubus fan for quite some time. Probably, yeah. you know, ever since Make Yourself came it out, uh, I was one of those dedicated little fans. Saw them, uh, went to the meet and greet and the Crow Left of the Murder tour. I uh, met the band, got my some stuff signed. I still have it. So i um, super, ex- super excited to have you on, man. Good. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right in with uh, um, some questions, you know, about like what it, you know, in the process of managing Incubus and a lot of the things that you uh, learned and uh, qualities that they had that made them so success- successful in the music business. And Because I, I know you managed them for... 16 years and then uh you was it last january of last year yeah 2014? About, yeah and, about a year and change since we parted company. yeah so it's a lot of it's a lot of time that's half yeah. my la- lifetime working <clears throat> with one of the biggest bands in the industry um what would you say were like several key factors that made incubus so successful that the band itself had control over and then what were some key factors that made them successful that they had no control over <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think when you talk about things that that you can control in the music business, which frankly isn't a long list. <laughs> um, That's probably one, live too. Yeah, the one that I think has the most impact is having a great attitude. And uh, I say that having managed, uh, I think Incubus was the 10th or 11th or maybe the 12th band uh, I ever managed. And so all of the bands I'd managed previously had talent. And I think, you know, at, at the top levels of the business, once you get signed to a major label, I think there's your kind of entry into the big leagues. Yeah. Um, there's a certain prerequisite of talent and we could all debate, you know, whether Britney Spears has talent or whether this artist has talent mm-hmm. or whatever it might be. But I'm going to say they all have talent and, and what separated Incubus from the other ones was their attitude and they they were they worked hard um, they they did the right things you know um, more often than not um, earlier in their career when I think it's even more important that you make the right decisions mm-hmm. um, you know I would say that they just had a consistent ability to see the right answer when it was presented to them. And, um, and so I think if you're an artist out there, well, it's certainly fun to make the music and, um, and, and that's something you can be in control of. Yeah. Um, so many of the decisions you make after you've made that music have, a, have as big or perhaps even bigger impact 
on your likelihood of success, success being defined as can you make music for a living yeah, and as opposed to a hobby. yeah. And so I think that was Incubus, the thing out of all the bands that I've worked with and, and have, not just that I've managed but have been a part of and seen friends of mine and folks in the business manage, that seems to be a common denominator. Um, and, and I think... Uh, certainly in the early days, you'll see, you've seen, you know, there's countless stories of big successful bands that implode for one reason or another. Yeah. And I think if you peeled away the layers of the onion, you would see that in that failure in the end was um, bad attitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when I say bad attitude, it's not like, you know, it's you're grumpy, drug, it's something it's more drugs, than drugs, you know, yeah. you get distracted, you yeah. take your eye off the ball, you stop yeah. seeing things, yeah. you know, at the big picture level and start focusing on things that um, aren't going to help you. Yeah. And as far as the attitude itself, what what's one thing that you feel like no member of Incubus would say? What, what would they would say, God, I, you know. I don't know that it's so much what you say is what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that I, I, I'm, I'm blanking on that one. Oh, okay. What might they say? I could, I could give you a bunch of flip answers. But, I... <laughs> but in ge general, you'll probably <clears throat> never hear Brandon or Mike or anyone, you know, say, well, you know, I can't do that. They probably had more of a, like, oh, let's no, do it uh, attitude. Well, getting to the right answer mm -hmm. sometimes is working through, I can't. And mm -hmm. um, so did they say I can't? Oh, yeah. What's, uh, what's one of the most significant things? What's one of the most significant things that they felt like they, they couldn't, sur like what was one obstacle that the band felt like they couldn't surpass? I don't know that, mm -hmm. I, you know, we, there were never, those kind of conversations didn't happen, you know, mm -hmm. where you're just thinking because yeah. when you're in the music business, it's easy to think about it kind of the blackboard version of how you think it's going to be. And then the reality is the game starts and whatever you were planning and thinking quickly goes away and then you're, you're in the moment, right? Yeah. So to your question, I, I can think of different moments over the years. A couple have come to mind. One, yeah. when, um, we were planning the Morning View tour, and um, we uh, they had, put, had Make Yourself, which you're a fan of. That record just kept going, and it had a very long lifespan as far as records go. Mm -hmm. And uh, and before Drive became a, a big pop single, it got top ten. It was their only top ten pop single, right? Mm -hmm. um, we went in the studio to start recording, or they went in the studio to to start recording Morning View, <laughs> right? And so when Morning View was ready to be released, you know, the whole time we were recording that record, I say we, the band was recording mm -hmm. that record, um, Drive just kept getting bigger. So by the time we went out to start promoting the new album, we went out and did a, a theater tour mm -hmm. um, first. We went out and we thought it would be a great idea to um, go out and play multiple nights in theaters in all the big cities across America, give the guys a chance to get some quick sellouts, get our toe in the water to see how lively it was going to be. Yeah. Um, and, but also there was a conversation, you know, I, I thought, you know, it'd be good for them to stick around in the city, read the reviews. You know, when you're on the road constantly, you never get a chance to unpack your bag even for a night. Yeah. So when you can stay two nights in a city, it's, it sounds strange, but you get to hang up your clothes and take your stuff out and come <laughs> back to the same place once. And so I recall with that we, we did that whole tour. It was bang up. We were blowing them out as quick as you could sell them. Mm -hmm. And so we, then we decided to do um, an arena tour. Yeah. And uh, so we had a sponsorship at that point. We were one of the first or second Honda Civic Tour sponsorships. And, um, and I recall there was going to be a press conference at a hotel in New York. I can't remember which one it was. But yeah. at any rate, <clears throat> I remember going up in the elevator with the guys in the band and Mikey asking me, it, you know, imagine we're on the first floor going up to the 16th floor. He goes, Renny, are you sure we can do this, man? <laughs> and I said, well, 
we're going to find out pretty quick. Doors open. They walk into the press conference, and, and that tour wound up being a slam dunk, right? Yeah. But there was uncertainty, you know, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the band's mind. And sometimes I think that's the role of a manager, the same way a, a coach um, is there to provide a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of reassurance. And I always thought that the fact that I was, you know, 20, 21 years older than the guys, mm -hmm. um, provided some kind of, you know, adult perspective <laughs> to it, if you will. Right. And so that was one that, that happened early in their career. Yeah. And then I'll, you know, share something that most Incubus fans, you know, are not aware of, right. Is that one of, the most seminal events, I think, you know, certainly during my 16 years with the band, was the Incubus HQ event we did at the, to launch the last, not this EP, the, their last full album. And uh, so we, we had this idea that, hey, you know what, well, we got to rehearse for a tour. You know, by now the guys have been very involved in, in digital promotions of one sort or another, yeah. streaming shows and all that stuff. And I, have been a huge fan of all that stuff, not just from a technology point of view, but from a point of view of that technology allowed a, a, a band with a story and a following and a commitment from their fans to engage in a very effortless uh, two-way conversation, as Brandon used to, to say it. And so anyway, we decided uh, that we would do this Incubus HQ thing and that uh, you know, as Brandon used to point out to me, you know, he goes, Randy, you know, you just are always like one you, he would mark he would make comment about my ambitious <laughs> plans sometimes or actually ambitious goals with a, 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 a certain weird comfort with okay we don't have all the answers but we'll figure it out and for a manager i think that's a much easier mentality to adopt than it is for an artist you know yeah. and so anyway long story short you're a problem solver in Managers tend to be more tactical. Yeah. They, I'm, I'm an emotional person, but more in a kind of amped up <laughs> <laughs> way, as the band pointed out to me many occasions. You know, um, but you know, but but much more accepting of uncertainty, and we'll work through this, and we'll figure it out, and we we got to just go. Right, that's, yeah. that's kind of my mentality. Mikey and I shared that mentality because it's different with different guys in, in different bands yeah, you know yeah. anyway long story short we went down we rented this place down on La Brea and everybody was into the idea and it was great and, and then then it was like okay what are, and, the, and the plan was we were going to broadcast each night for a week and we were going to invite people to our Incubus HQ and we we're going to set up the band in the middle of this room and there was going to be art installations and they could paint <laughs> and they could do all kinds of great things and so all these questions about yeah. how many people are coming, Steve, and what if there's too many people, and da 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 da. I was like, dude, we'll figure that shit out. <laughs> Just do it. Yeah, so mastering we, uncertainty. Yeah. So by the time we got to the first day, I can just say that every single band member was in some state of disarray, um, and I can recall, and I, and I still get shivers down my back thinking about it, walking around behind in the alley hoping that Brandon was going to show up, you know, because it was the whole thing just freaked him out at the end of the day. I don't know. What is this? And you know, what are these people are all standing right behind us, Steve? And you know, mm -hmm. one of the band members going, what if somebody comes in here and wants to shoot us? I mean, crazy stuff. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and when you're the manager, it's why I say, Hey, what if somebody comes in here to shoot us? I, you know, what do you say? You go, well, I hope they met you guys. Yeah. You know, yeah. They're yeah. going to shoot us. They're going to shoot us. Whatever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> anyway. Um, so I say that because when, once we got to the music part of it and Brandon did show up and, um, and all the band guys showed up and did their different bits, once we got to that, it, it was just the most natural thing in the world. And so after after two nights, it took Brandon, I think, a couple nights to warm up because he, you know, he's a, a creature of his routine and all that stuff, which is 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 helped him do the shows without canceling very often. He takes great care of his voice and all that stuff. Yeah. But you know, I wouldn't be a, a, a big shock if I said if you had you know who the worrier was in the band Brandon was the biggest worrier in the band so anyway <laughs> right. long story short 
it wound up being spectacularly uh, successful for what we wanted to do. Um, and I can't tell you how many over the next year and a half how many times I got emails from Incubus fans going, hey, Ren, you should do that Incubus HQ in London or you should do it on a boat or you should do it on a this and that. And I would always respectfully uh, go, yeah, maybe we should. But, <laughs> but thinking there's no way I am ever going to volunteer to take us on that ride again, even though it wound up working out great. Yeah, yeah. Well, it just kind of illustrates the fact that um, there's uncertainty, you know, that you deal with, period, you know, at, at all levels, not just for the independent artists just starting out, but even acts that are well established, they, they still have to deal with, you know, not knowing and the uncertainty and, and fears and things like that. Uh, what, That's what, not specific to the music business. I, yeah. I think it's heightened somewhat in the music business because the product is, is the creation of human beings and, and it's... Um, it can be judged on a taste rather than a utility basis. You drive a car, it show, you know, I mean, yeah, it's not a, it, pers- it's not a, there's a whole funny yeah. yardstick of the music business because anybody can do it and anybody can say it's great or think it's shit. And, and that, that adds an extra layer of what I call the FIP factor, the fear, insecurity, and paranoia <laughs> that uh, life in general breeds but the music business in particular kind of can feed that beast in ways that aren't healthy sometimes yeah yeah but just learning to move like move on in spite of all that in spite of the fear and the uncertainty it's probably like the most the best attitude you know or quality to hold so um I know that you've uh, been doing like a lot uh, online with uh, with uh, Renman Music and Business, mm-hmm. and I know you have an online course called Renman U uh, uh-huh. for independent artists. I was just wondering if you could tell us more about that. Sure. Well, you know the Renman MB uh, thing started um, is kind of a hobby type of thing. You know, for me, you know, as you know, all the Incubus fans are, are well aware of them. They're all very happy right now because Incubus has finally put out some new music again. But what happens with bands in general, not just Incubus, is that as you, when you've been doing it a while, I think it's tougher to get inspired to do it again, right? Yeah. And you know, when I say inspired, rather inspired suggests a certain, a different level of motivation than doing it. Because you know we need to make some money, or right. you know everybody. Or you're in the so struggling phase, yeah. Yeah, and in uh, the creative process, you know, I think if you look at every great band, there's a period, and you, you know you have to be in it long enough to be able to look back to see it, right? Where there's a period of two, three albums where bands are really at their peak creative powers, and after that, you get sometimes you get glimpses <laughs> of it, sometimes you never see it again, you yeah. know, and so. It led to longer and longer gaps in between making music, you know, promoting it, and then getting fired up to do it again. So I started yeah. this, you know, Renman MB thing, is my way of uh, helping mentor young artists and professionals because it was it was fun for me for for whatever reason. Um, people have been asking for my opinion, whether it's an artist or young professionals in the biz. Hey, Ren, what do you think about this, or what do you think about that? So. Um, I decided to do what I'd kidded around about doing for years, you know, which is, hey, I should, I'm going to do my own online school of rock, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I put the, the website up there, started with 24 videos. There's now, God, losing track, 500-ish clips of, mm-hmm. uh, of advice and, about the music business. And what started with me posting the videos evolved into this web show, Run Man Live, which was... Um, another attempt to, to, to help solve one of the, the biggest problems when people are starting, which is access. You know, how do you get access to people in the business? Yeah. How do you get their attention? How do you get somebody that has influence and, and perspective to help you uh, do something great? So, yeah. um, so we've done 103 of those shows now with what I say kind of canned but it's true that some of the smartest most talented most successful people in the business artists and professionals yeah and then lots of up and coming people that are just starting so it's been a great uh, cross section uh, of people all with the agenda of okay let's talk about today's music business so yeah. um you know that that was a lot of fun but at some point in there it occurred to me that 
Um, I was leaving a lot for young artists and professionals. I don't want to say young, aspiring artists and professionals to kind of sort out on their own. And then I hired a, a one of our former interns, you know, who had just finished up at USC, you know, music school. And so I had this idea to do this Ren Man U thing, but I did it very much in a very kind of the way I do stuff, just kind of look and shoot, you know, I'm just going to do this. So yeah. we put together this 10 week online program and it was really me just riffing on the music business, but it was very similar to kind of the Ren Man Live thing with the blackboard, right? Yeah. And so what, what occurred to me, you know, was that we needed to do something that was a little bit more formal, a little bit more in the context of the classroom scenario where instead of everybody ask me your question, it'd be like, okay, I'm going to give you a lesson, if you will, and I'm going to ask you some questions to see if you actually get it, you mm -hmm. know? And so that became Ren Man U. And, um, and we decided to turn it into a product and rather than shoot it like we've done the original Ren Man U online, you know, web series, we decided to, to take a more measured approach and, you know, it was more sit down, you know, I don't want to say it was scripted, but it was certainly much more tight um, than watching a two hour webcast and trying to figure out what the highlights was. It, I, I'm giving them the highlights. And yeah. Accompany it with text and in questions that hopefully make people think about it, right? And um, and we started selling it for ninety nine bucks. And and a uh, few people asked me, so why are you selling it now? And part of the reason was because um, you know at, I talk about this notion of hobby versus career. Yeah. You know, and if you want to continue to do something, um, you need to have a way to pay for it. Right? Yeah. And so if you're an artist, if you don't sell music, if you don't sell T-shirts, if you can't sell tickets, yeah. you won't be able to turn this into a living. And uh, so we decided to charge for it, right, um, because I wanted to help pay the bills here. Um, but I also, we, we could have charged a lot more. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, you could. You could because yeah, there's yeah. a lot in there. Uh, yeah. There's a there, lot in there. Well, I'm happy to hear that, you know, and God knows I've had quite a few folks offering me editorial on that. I, but I think in the end of the day, um, and there may be, you know, a more premium version of it, you know, we'll see how that goes, right? Mm -hmm. But um, but I know musicians. I know the people I'm talking to don't have a lot of money, right? Yeah. And and I know that for, for the folks that are lucky enough to have a rich old man or somebody that'll sign on a student loan to go to Berkeley or even my son who goes to USC or Columbia or... Yeah. NYU or any of the top schools there, you know, you're talking about 50, 60 grand to learn the music business. And, and with, that, with no disrespect intended to those places, when it comes specifically to the music business versus learning how to do orchestrations yeah. and play your instrument or learn yeah. how to use a recording, you know, desk and all of that stuff, yeah. um, that piece of paper, the degree you get in college specific to the music business doesn't get you anything, yeah. okay? Um, I didn't graduate from college. Jimmy Ivey didn't graduate, probably never saw college. Dr. Dre didn't go to college, you know? Yeah. I mean, I could go on. Bill Gates didn't finish college. Steve yeah. Jobs didn't finish college. Yeah. You know, Elon <laughs> yeah. Musk didn't finish. So, yeah. you know, achievement doesn't come with a piece of paper. Achievement is happens in the real world. With experiencing, so, being in it. Yeah, and you hit the, the nail on the head, you know, is that experience in the music business, context, in the music business is everything. So if some kid thinks he knows all the terms in a publishing agreement. He'll let you know by saying all of them. <laughs> yes, but, but if I ask you, why is it a, a publishing agreement? You know, why is having a great publishing deal perhaps more important than a record deal? They'll all go blank on you, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason is because when you sell records, you got to pay back the record company, quote unquote, for all the promotion and marketing and and so forth that it takes to sell that record and the cost of the record and the cost of the producer and all that stuff. So it becomes the equivalent of you've paid off the house, but the bank still owns the house. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the publishing side of it, you make your money and there's no deductions. And, and so if I ask 100 kids and ask them what, why is publishing important, they never say that. And so somebody in those courses forgot the context, yeah. right? Um, a gal was you taking our course the other day asked me about, you know, we, there was a 
she thought it was a trick question on one of the quizzes, you know, about the artist that procrastinates too long when an opportunity comes along. And the lesson was about both artists and professionals, whether you're a manager, label, or whatever, have to respect the decision-making process that's part of, of building a career. And that means that you have opportunities presented in front of you. They're, you're rarely the only one getting that opportunity presented. You might be the one, the first one on the tee. And mm -hmm. so there's a time for debate. There's a time for discussion. Um, more often than not, vast majority of the time, you'll make a decision in the music business with no certainty of outcome, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that only absolutely. happens after the fact that everybody talks about, oh, what you should have. Should oh, you have look done. back over your shoulder and that was a good decision yeah. or a bad decision. And so you have to make decisions in that moment. And mm -hmm. so when that fear and that insecurity and that paranoia is working on you, it can twist your head. And uh, so, you know, anyway, um, when I explained it to her in context, the, her, her, her point was, well, doesn't the manager just tell the artist where they're showing up? And there might have been a time with Incubus, you know, and with other bands earlier in their careers uh, where a manager might have said, this is what we're doing and it happens. But as bands get successful and as they get more experience, um, it's the artist's name on that marquee, not the manager or the record label. So yeah. you have to be respectful of that process. And so for her, that was a big shock that I just, I think lots of kids think that the manager or the record label tells the artist what to do. And if you spoke to anybody that knows me, they would certainly tell you that I am a man with opinions, you know. But at the end of the day, the manager works for the artist, yeah. not the other way around. Although sometimes you'll talk to artists and they'll go, they'll, they'll think in their own head they're working for you. But that's not actually the case, yeah. you know. So that, that's the, the, it was the idea behind Red Man U was to give it some context. And unlike some of these university programs that you could pay – you know, I don't want to pick on Berkeley School of Music, but, you know, I, I quote unquote guest lectured or taught one of their courses, right? Mm -hmm. 16, 1800 bucks. Yeah. I chat with the students on the weekend in a decidedly low tech way, right? <laughs> and, um, and even that course had very little to do with real context. And, and so, but people are paying a lot of money for that. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a whole nother. Yeah, that's a whole nother uh, case there. Just the colleges yeah. and edu higher education. Well, but, as it know. turns out, they're in the business of putting out pieces of paper. Yeah, and I suppose spending a lot of time talking about how relevant that piece of paper might be when you're done mm -hmm. uh, would not be helpful in the discussion. I reckon. Yeah. And uh, and that's not to say that there isn't some things to learn there, right? Because yeah. there are. But you're paying a lot for it. But you're paying a lot of money for in missing a big piece context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I suppose also, if I'm being really honest about it, if somebody's talking with me about it, there is, there is a, as you point out at the top, and I'm very flattered that you feel that way. For better or worse, I have tons of experience doing this. I'm not talking theory here. I'm talking reality. Yeah. And, um, and some people, I think, might be scared off by that. But the people that are really, truly serious about doing something great in the music business will figure out, hopefully sooner rather than later, that having an honest, real take on what you're getting into is hugely important if you're going to be a problem solver. Yeah, you have to see reality laid bare. You know, as I like to say it all the time, when I was managing the band, sometimes you'd say something nobody wanted to hear it. I have to tell them, I'm just reading the writing on the wall, folks. I didn't put it there. Yeah. And <laughs> don't hate on me. I was actually, I remember watching the um, interview. Uh, you had a snippet of Brandon saying that uh, he wanted to, thought about having you assassinated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, and, and, and yes, yes. And, you know, by the way, uh, you know, those are all, you know, Brandon can smile and, and just, <laughs> flip and all that stuff but i remember when the guy who shot it showed it to me right um that might be for artist manager relationships thing that 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 should be required viewing um <laughs> because he meant it and there were times when he really i don't say kill me but he'd certainly you know would have liked <laughs> to hang me out and wound me you know and and to be fair about it um the feeling was often mutual, <laughs> but from different points of view. And over time, yeah. you know, Brandon said it. Brandon is great with words. You know, he, he had 
maybe it was in one of those interviews, he goes, you know what, it, what occurred to him after a while was that we're, we're, we're talking about the same things, but we have different language to describe it, right? And over time, I think we did a better job of uh, translating, yeah. you know, and, yeah. uh, but it's, it, it can be difficult at times. Yeah, but you uh, hung with it for 16 years, and yeah. I'm grateful, and millions of other Incubus fans are very grateful. Uh, well, and too. I'm one of those grateful people, too, <laughs> and, and I wish them the, the best of uh, success, you know, going forward. They're a talented bunch of guys, and uh, I have some memories for a lifetime. Awesome. Me too, man, for the, all the times I listened to Popped In an Album. So uh, where can uh, we find uh, Ren Menu? Where can we go? Yeah, Check well, let me tell you, you would go to uh, http colon slash slash www.renmanu, R-E-N-M-A-N-U dot com. And, um, and you can sign up. It's ninety nine ninety nine right now for the folks that have signed up early. Um, eventually, the course is going to be just a straight standalone so somebody can buy it, you know, and there's the course and it's up to them, right? Mm -hmm. For this first batch of folks... Um, we decided to do it somewhat similarly that we did with the original Ren Man U thing, where we re were releasing one section of it a week. Okay. And I've offered all the folks, you know, that you know bought it early. We're doing a Google Hangout on Mondays, um, where they can ask me questions about it. Yeah. And so, uh, you know that that might become a premium thing in the future. Okay. Uh, I will say it's been it's been very helpful for the folks, you know, to have um, a chance to talk about some of those trick questions. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it's been very, uh, it's been a lot of fun for me. I really mm -hmm. enjoy uh, talking with people that are on a mission to do something, whether it's, you know, starting a business or starting a band. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's good stuff. All right, man. Well, we'll have uh, that linked up below. So uh, no one has to type it in. They'll just be able to click it through on the seedsofmusic.net website. Uh, Ren, man, wow, this is a badass interview. <laughs> I'm Great. excited oh, hearing the stories, just thanks. personally, but just, yeah, just good. for the content. Well, thanks for having me, and uh, good luck to all the folks that are um, listening. To you. Is your show video, or is it uh, just audio? I have video and an audio podcast, so I got YouTube okay. and on iTunes. All right, great. Well, for all you folks out there dreaming of doing something big, good luck to you, and uh, don't overthink it. Just do it. <laughs> that's a true that's that's a truth right there perfect <laughs> all right all right check you. you take care now bye-bye bye-bye